Today we'll continue talking about uh, Chicago School Economists. Um, and um, in particular, the new classical uh, macroeconomics school of thought. And before I jump to that, I just going to do a small recap of um, what Friedman, how Friedman thought of the Phillips curve. So, who can remind me what the Phillips curve is? Yeah. Exactly. So it's an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. But for Friedman, this uh, relationship is actually vertical in the long run, um, as unemployment will always go back to a natural rate. And the way he explained that, it's because uh, there are asymmetries of information between workers and employers. And when there is inflation, workers are fooled to thinking that uh, the real wage hasn't changed, although the real wage has changed because there is inflation in prices, but uh, not inflation in nominal wages. And so they uh, accept more uh, labor, they extend the labor supply, which uh, temporarily increase employment until uh, workers realize they've been fooled, uh, then they readjust downwards their labor supply and we go back to the natural rate of unemployment. There is something that uh, Bob Lucas, uh, who is um, the Nobel Prize uh, in 95, uh, that he didn't like in this story, is that uh, workers can be fooled systematically at each period. They don't learn. And, uh, and they are also uh, less able to, to form good expectations as employers, uh, which he found a problematic assumption. So uh, Lucas um, really created a revolution in the way uh, economists do ma study macroeconomics. Uh, and after Lucas, um, the, the mainstream is to follow the DSG paradigm where models are general, general equilibrium models. General, it means that uh, it's, a, it's a model of the whole economy, not uh, of a given sector of the economy. Uh, equilibrium in Lucas' uh, meaning, it means that uh, at each period, agents optimize, and that uh, at each period, the, the optimum under constraint uh, is reached. It's in, they optimize intertemporally. That's why it's dynamic, so uh, that takes time into account. And the reason why there are business fluctuations, uh, fluctuations in aggregate variables like output, employment, inflation, is because of stochastic shocks. Because without uh, these shocks, uh, the equilibrium would, would, would stay, uh, I mean, all the variables would stay constant. But there are some, uh, some random things, uh, surprises happening uh, to the economy and agents react to that. The big uh, assumption that uh, Lucas introduced um, is rational expectation, which was first proposed by John Muth. And rational expectation is the idea that agents' prediction are the same as the best modeler as the best economist. So, in what we've seen in Friedman, um, the expectations are adaptive, meaning that uh, workers, for example, they form their expectation of future prices by looking at past prices and the mistake they've made in their previous uh, expectation in the previous period and adjusting in function of uh, the, the mistake they made, so to correct a bit their mistake. But um, for Lucas, when we assume that people are rational, we must conclude that they have the, the best uh, expectation possible about the future. 
And it's as if they, they would know the model, they would know how the economy behaves, and given the information available to them, they form the expectation in a Bayesian way, in, in the best way possible. Um, they don't take into account just uh, past prices and their expectation mistake, like in adaptive expectation, they take into account all the information that's available to them. And uh, on average, they don't make mistakes. Whereas for adaptive uh, learners, they, they make mistakes, uh, even though they, they, yeah, they make mistakes at every period. Yes? Um, you know, so the question is, uh, how do they take uh, everything into account? Just checking. Um, oh, there is a problem with the zoom link. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, how do they take everything into account? Um, so they have. There is a model of the economy. That's a DSG, DSG model, and uh, the rational expectation assumption is that uh, people in society also know this model. And um, they, they have access to certain information, for example, what happened in the previous periods, uh, what are prices, what are, etc. And uh, given this information and given the, the model that they know, um, they can uh, anticipate what, um, what will be the evolution of the variables, just as the modeler would do. Yes, exactly. So uh, when I say people know this model, it means uh, agents, so individuals, firms, uh, the government. So actually, in uh, in DSG models, in the at least uh, in in the models of this um, this period, it has changed in the last ten years. Um, the, the the assumption was a representative agent. So the whole economy was modeled as if it was one person taking decisions. But uh, this person is supposed to know the model and uh, to infer correctly from uh, what they can observe from uh, reality uh, what the, the future will be. They, they form their expectation in a rational way. And they don't make uh, systematic mistakes. Um, so with this uh, rational expectation assumption, then only unanticipated, unanticipated shocks can, have, uh, can affect decisions. Because imagine that um, at each recession, the central bank or the government increases the money supply. Then there is no surprise when a recession comes and the central bank increases the money supply. So, people would not change the way they, they, they plan to behave because they anticipated it. The thing is that the way the Phillips curve worked, the, the, the reason why uh, we could lower unemployment at the cost of some inflation is, at least in Friedman's mind, because there was a surprise uh, an unanticipated uh, increase in money supply uh, that fooled workers into supplying more labor. With the rational expectation assumption, you could not fool people because uh, at least you could not fool them systematically because they, they will anticipate in advance that the, reaction, the, the government would increase the money supply and they would understand that if um, there is suddenly uh, more job openings, it's, uh, it's not because the, the real wage has increased, is just because uh, of this uh, monetary policy and they will not uh, accept the new jobs. So for uh, this paradigm, the Phillips curve is vertical even in the short run, when there is an, uh, un when there is an anticipated uh, shock in, in a monetary policy, it doesn't affect the unemployment rate. Lucas um, was also uh, cru critical in um, launching a new methodology for macroeconomics, and uh, notably with regard to the Lucas critique, 
So Lucas uh, noticed that the way people behave depend on the policy that's in place. So if the government changes the policy, then people will, changes, will change their behavior. And the way econometric macroeconomic model were uh, estimated until Lucas, it was by um, looking at past data, past observation. Um, and uh, so you have a, a system of relationship between the variables of your economy. And using past data, you estimate the parameters in these relationships uh, to maximize the likelihood. And um, the thing is that these parameters uh, reflect behavioral uh, behaviors of people. And so these parameters would change if the government would change their policy. So we could not use this model to model, to, to predict what will happen if the government changes their policy. Uh, but it's precisely the goal of these models to do that. So uh, what Lucas advocated is instead to have um, structural models instead of reduced form. So what I've just explained is a reduced form model where you just uh, model the um, relationship between the aggregate variables that you can measure in the data. A structural model, instead, you model how people take their decision at the individual level. So it's uh, an individualistic methodology. And uh, from this, uh, you infer what happens at the macro level uh, and, uh, and the, the, the shape of the relationship um, at the macro level. And, uh, and what we should estimate for uh, Lucas, it's not the reduced form, not the relationship at the aggregate, but the structural model that uh, underlies it, so that uh, we can predict what will happen uh, when there is a change in policy. And um, now that I've explained that, uh, maybe we'll understand the, this quote of Lucas that uh, just said that what I've said, given that the structure of an econometric model consists of optimal decision rules of agents, and that optimal decision rules vary systematically with changes in the structure of series relevant to the decision maker. So when he says when decision rules vary systematically with changes in the structure of series relevant to the decision maker, it's saying behaviors of people vary with uh, policies. Policies is the structure of series. It follows that any change uh, in policy will systematically alter the structure of the econometric model. Is there a question? Yes. Just wait, I, I put the microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so if I understand the question correctly, it's uh, why uh, doesn't it work with the reduced form? Because the reduced form already incorporates uh, how people behave. Is that right? Yes, the thing is that um, people change how they behave when the policy changes. And so, okay, in a way we can say there are two, two layers of behavior. There is a... Um, the, 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 the deep level, how I form my decision by optimizing my utility. And uh, there is the, the superficial layer. It's uh, what you observe if I, uh, uh, whether like how, how many uh, hours of work I, I, I do, uh, how much I save, things like that. And uh, in a reduced form, uh, you, you just take the, the parameters of the superficial layer into account. Like for example, the savings rate. And uh, you don't model that this savings rate is actually the optimal outcome of a deep um, uh, optimization behavior. And so you don't model that it changes when the circumstances change. Yeah. Y yes? Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Um, yes, uh, yes, it's related to uh, to that. Um, it's related to uh, to the performativity in the sense that uh, for Lucas, we should a policy should take into account uh, its effect on uh, on people's behavior, um, and um, and if. Uh, Yes, and, and, and the, the policy has, has a direct effect um, by the new law and an indirect effect by the, the changes in behavior and, uh, and the, 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 the model should take that into account. So the, the model should uh, take into account the influence of the model itself in a sense if by the model we, we, we understand that uh, the different policies that uh, are within the model that can be modeled. So which kind of model we used? We use, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a macroeconomist, but, but, um, but I guess uh, the, the, the mainstream is to use the SGE models, uh, which hopefully are robust to this critique, um, because uh, in the SGE models, uh, people ha have, uh, are rational in a very specific way. And, um, and, they, and they understand uh, the model, so if the reality is just like the model, then uh, people, uh, and if, yeah, then people uh, are, are correctly modeled and, uh, and everything, everything is taken into account. Uh, the issue then is that uh, the model is not an accurate representation of reality. Um, so, so, yes. Um, yes. So reduce, so for example, the Phillips curve, um, the Phillips curve is a reduced form between uh, unemployment and inflation. But, um, but, uh, sorry, but um, if you want to, um, to understand, like th this would be uh, the, the, the Phelps model of the Phillips curve. You know, uh, Phelps models the decision of firms to hire, uh, the decision of workers to, to supply labor, etc. This would be a structural model because you have, uh, you model the, the optimization uh, of each agent. In a structural model, you model just the relationship between aggregate variables. So this, you don't know where it comes from in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. um, now, uh, Lucas um, was uh, yeah thought that uh, monetary shocks were important, an important driver of business fluctuations. Um, so that um, when people um, when there is, for example. Um, less competition in a, in a market where you produce so that uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have more uh, income because the prices will rise, uh, then you will work more, you will increase your labor supply uh, for the duration of this uh, increase uh, in prices for what you sell. And uh, you will work less in subsequent periods uh, where uh, it would be re returned to normal. And so the driver of uh, the, um, I mean, the way agents react to shocks for Lucas is to uh, substitute labor and leisure interoperably. So people at each period make the decision of how many hours they will work. Um, they, 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 they work more when uh, the wage is higher and they have more leisure when the wage is lower. And that's always, their decision is always uh, the optimal decision. They make it. And as a result, uh, the, poli the, the, the policy recommendation of uh, Lucas models are simple. There should be no state intervention because uh, agents already uh, react optimally to, uh, to the shocks. 
Um, like Friedman, uh, he thinks there should be a stable money supply growth, so no monetary policy, uh, because monetary policy would be ineffective uh, to affect decisions, at least if it's anticipated. So maybe you can just you can use a money su supply, a mon monetary policy only once, because if you do it systematically, uh, it won't have uh, any effect. And a balanced budget, at least uh, over. Uh, an ex over the cycle, so over a few years. Uh, because uh, fiscal policy is also uh, ineffective, according to Lucas, so you cannot uh, stimulate the economy by raising the deficit. So the, the, the budget uh, should be balanced be between uh, taxes and spending. So, so basically, uh, it doesn't advocate, for, I mean, these models do not uh, I have as a conclusion that there shouldn't be any policy, only policy rules and simple rules that uh, is basically an absence of, uh, of policy. But Lucas was uh, very good uh, in understanding uh, the methodology, what was lacking in economics and what uh, his new methodology brought and also the limitation of this new product. And he reckoned that uh, the policy conclusion of his model just followed directly from the premises. And that we, can, we couldn't prove the premises, like rational expectation, for example. So um, he was well aware of that and uh, agreed that we could not use these models to uh, give polit political advice. And so uh, the policy conclusions of this model are subject to the no exploitation principle um, they sh these models should be thought as a fundamental research. It will take uh, lots of time to understand how society works. It's just preliminary. And we should refrain ourselves from uh, using these uh, models that are necessarily uh, far from reality uh, to um, give policy recommendation. Unfortunately, Lucas is probably the only one to have respected this uh, no exploitation principle with these models. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the foundational uh, model of Lucas, which is called expectations and the neutrality of money. So what we mean by the neutrality of money is that monetary policy doesn't uh, have an influence uh, on real variables. So monetary policy cannot be used um, to stimulate the economy. Uh, the neutrality of money, it's related to the um, quantity theory of money, that if you raise the money supply, it would just raise prices and have uh, no impact whatsoever on the, any actions, any uh, behavior. So in this model, there is, um, it's an overlapping generation model with two periods. In period one, the young people work and uh, consume part of uh, what they produce and sell the rest to old people uh, who have uh, some income from what they saved before retirement. And in the second period, uh, young people have become old, old people have died, and, uh, and now people that are old uh, consume what they have saved uh, previously. Uh, there is rational expectation and uh, the young should choose their production. And uh, the thing is that the, the economy is separated in two markets. And so young can only sell their products in the markets uh, where they are, so to uh, only half of uh, the old population. And the thing is that uh, the young people do not know how many producers there are in, uh, in their markets. They, they know that there are as many young as old people, but they don't know uh, if in their own market uh, there is half of, uh, half of the young are in their own market, or maybe a quarter, or maybe three quarters. So they do not know whether um, prices will be, will be high or, or low. Uh, if there are more producers than, uh, than, than old people, uh, then there will be a tough competition and, and prices will be low. And in this case, they should not uh, work too much because, the, because 
of intertemporal substitution because of what uh, I've said before, because uh, the, the wage they will receive is low, so they should enjoy more leisure in this case. And uh, you'll say, yes, but they can observe the price and determine the, the, how they work in function of the price and infer from the price if there are uh, a lot of producers or too few producers. But the thing is that there is also uh, a money supply shock. Uh, so a vari an, e yeah, an exogenous and random variation in the money supply that affect both markets and that will uh, raise all prices or decrease all prices. So the producers, they don't really know when they observe a high price if it's because there is just inflation, and uh, in which case um, they should uh, work uh, normally, or if it's because there is not a lot of producers in their markets, in which case they should work more as usual uh, because the, the real wage is higher. And because people have rational expectation, what they'll do is they, they compare, they, they look at past data, past observation, and um, they look at uh, variation in prices where they caused by a real, a real shock, uh, meaning, um, yeah, the, the, the variation in the number of producers, or where they caused by money supply shock. And so they, they compare, they, they do complicated math, they compare the variances of, uh, of uh, the, the share of the variance in prices due to uh, the variation in money supply and the share due to the change in, uh, in a real wage. And if they observe that in the past most of price variations were explained by monetary policy, then they will not adapt their working load uh, too much because they know it's just a, a nominal variable, nominal signal, um, and uh, it doesn't mean, it means that the, the real wage is, is, is normal. And uh, the conclusion to uh, this uh, simple and uh, unrealistic model is that any government intervention that's predictable or systematic will have no real effect. Uh, it's often called the island model, even though Lucas doesn't speak of island uh, in his paper, because uh, the way it's uh, taught, uh, the separate markets are called uh, two islands. Okay, and um, the thing is that this model uh, is, is very peculiar. What, what would this uh, really well represent uh, the economy? Uh, we, we, we can doubt it. Uh, but the year after, uh, Lucas claimed that there is empirical support for this model, where he compared um, the, for different uh, countries the impact on uh, monetary policy, so on uh, growth in the money supply, on uh, real behavior. And he showed that in countries where there is more volatility in the money supply, meaning in countries where the central bank or the government uses more monetary policy, then people react less to it. Uh, there is less variability in, in output uh, due to, uh, uh, less impact uh, on output to, to, um, to money supply growth in these countries, uh, which supports uh, his model. Yes? Um, so, so in his model, uh, there is not the same mix in the two markets. There is a, the, the old people are equally distributed. So half of the old people are in market one, half of the old people are in market two. Uh, but uh, there is a random share of, uh, of young people that are in market one and a random share that is in market two. So Lucas um, didn't uh, care about having a realistic model. He just wanted to have a model to prove his point, basically. So he chose the simplest uh, possible uh, model where he could uh, prove his point. 
and the way uh, he interprets uh, the, this, uh, this share of young people, it's uh, income windfall actually. So it's a real shock, uh, so it's a shock to the real wage. That in his model comes from the share of young people, but uh, that you can think of uh, a, a shock in the real wage that comes from whatever uh, source. Yes? Is what? Is none of the shocks predictable? So, so by definition, a shock is not predictable. Uh, it's it's a random uh, realization. But, um, what, but, but looking at past observation, you know how the shocks are distributed. So you know uh, if uh, the nominal shock, uh, you know the variance of the nominal shock and you know the variance of the real shock. And if, say, there is no variance in the real shock, zero, it means that the real wage is always the same. You know for sure that if uh, prices are high, it's due to the nominal shock. And you know that you shouldn't adapt uh, your uh, numbers of hours because it's only nominal. Yeah. So the, sh the shock is not uh, predictable, but uh, you, can, uh, you can guess uh, what explains uh, what you see given uh, the past observations. Because the, the assumption is that you, 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 you don't observe the, the, the current shocks, but you observe the previous shocks. Okay. Um, Thomas Sargent uh, came up with uh, Wallace uh, with a very similar uh, idea. So only uh, three years later. Um, the policy ineffectiveness proposition uh, that shows that if we assume rational expectations and flexible wages, only random shocks can affect uh, output and employment. And again, monetary policy cannot systematically increase outputs during downturns, as agents will anticipate the inflation and revise their wage and their labor supply accordingly. And uh, Sargent was with Lucas a uh, strong advocate of uh, new classical macroeconomics. And um, together, they, they wrote uh, after Keynesian economics, so where they detailed the, the, the new paradigm, uh, where everything changes with respect to uh, Keynesian economics. The object under study. For Keynesian, what mattered was uh, what happens where th when there is a deep crisis, like the 29 crisis. Um, and, uh, and how could we uh, cure involuntary unemployment? For Lucas, uh, what matters are business fluctuations around uh, a trend, which is uh, the equilibrium, and, uh, and involuntary unemployment is simply impossible for them because, uh, because the equilibrium is always realized. Then there is a change in methodology the Lucas critique, that uh, we should use structural models, model the, how uh, agents optimize, and the equilibrium discipline, which means that the model should be micro-funded, meaning that we should understand how each individual takes their decision, and not just only model uh, the relationship between aggregate variables. And uh, the equilibrium discipline also supposes that people optimize it. And uh, I would add that with Lucas, uh, there is a change in the meaning of equilibrium. Uh, before, uh, for Keynesians, equilibrium was a state of rest, uh, of, of stability in, uh, in the, the variables that describe the economy. But for Lucas, it's um, an outcome of the optimization process, and he thinks of equilibrium as intertemporal. So, because uh, people optimize not only uh, period by period, but they optimize for the, the whole future, uh, even if they readjust their optimization at each period, uh, there is an equilibrium path, uh, and at each period, 
even though the variables change, they change optimally um, as a reaction to shocks, and we can talk as an equilibrium at each period, an intertemporal equilibrium. Uh, so, in a way, the notion of equilibrium in Lucas loses uh, its, uh, its uh, interest. Then, the cause of uh, fluctuations uh, is radically different. For Keynesians, it's the sluggishness, sluggishness or the, the rigidities in prices and wages, and uh, it's imperfect competitions, monopolies, etc., uh, which create deviation from the optimal equilibrium where, uh, of full employment and efficient economy. For uh, Lucas and Sargent, the cause of business fluctuations are unpredictable shocks that are not explained in the models. And the policy recommendations are opposites. For Canadian uh, government needs to intervene, and for new classicals, not. Uh, the, we, we, they, they promote laissez-faire, and that is uh, no, no state policy. And uh, Sergeants uh, dev developed the theory of rational expectations uh, in the, the statical, uh, with the new statistical uh, tools, and it applied it uh, to, to many uh, cases. Um, for example, so yeah, both in an applied way and a theoretical way. Uh, from a theoretical perspective, he showed that uh, even if we don't take the rational expectation assumption uh, to the extreme, um, under certain condition, bounded rationality, so if people are not perfectly rational, uh, but have some bounds to their rationality, or adaptive learning, uh, converges to rational expectations. And with James Hansen, another Nobel Prize, uh, they also introduced robust control theory uh, to, to economics. It's a theory that comes from uh, math and physics to model decision-making under uncertainty. Because they realized that uh, it's implausible that people know the model when economists themselves don't know the true model. So we as we are, we are uncertain about the, the model that uh, describes the economy, we can consider several models, and we should take decisions that are not bad, or not too bad, in pretty much each of these possible models. And that's why it's a robust decision-making. It's because um, whatever the, the, the true model, the decision you take will not make you lose too much. Uh, yeah, so he, he extended uh, the, uh, he pushed forward the, the limit of rational expectations. But what really uh, gave uh, prominence to the DSG paradigm is the work from uh, Kidland and Prescott and notably the, the model they introduced, the real business cycles model. But before talking about this model, I will talk about uh, another big uh, contribution of there, uh, rules rather than discretions, the inconsistency of optimal planning. In this paper, they argue that policy making needs to be credible, and for that, uh, policy making need, policy makers need to make commitment and stick to it. Because if they don't, then they lose credibility. And because a, a strong way where, influence, where policy work is through the, the just uh, announcing the policy, uh, if you are not credible when you announce the policy, people will not behave the way you want. People will not behave the way uh, that would be compatible with the policy. Um, to, to, um, yeah, before I explain uh, their arguments, um, I'll show it with an example. Uh, patent policy. So the reason why we have patents is to increase innovation. We can take the example of a vaccine against uh, COVID. Um, if there were not uh, any patenting, maybe we wouldn't have any vaccine against COVID because the uh, pharmaceutical industry wouldn't have had uh, any incentive to, to, to research any vaccine because they, if they had discovered one, 
then any competitors could have produced it and they couldn't have um, uh, obtained the, the, the profits from their uh, discovery. But the thing is that once you have a COVID vaccine, uh, it would be welfare improving to cancel the patent, if you're the government, and to share it with the world so that every country can have uh, cheap vaccines. But the problem with, uh, according to Kildan and Prescott, is that if you do that, then firms, so if in the second period you cancel the patent policy you've enacted in the first period, then firms will anticipate it and will not produce vaccine in the first place. And the only way you can, then, you can make them uh, research for the vaccines if, is if you're credible that you will commit to this policy even if in second period you would be better off by reversing this policy. So they call time consistent, so the, the choice of, of their terminology is a bit weird, but uh, yeah, they called time consistent a policy where the decision maker optimizes at each period the policy uh, of the current period and of the next period taking into account how people have behaved in the past. And is, so the time consistent optimal would be to cancel the, the patent for COVID in period two, right? Because you have the vaccine, so now the optimal thing is to provide it cheaply. And uh, what they show in this paper is that the time consistent optimum is not the optimum. But, they argue, it is the way that uh, uh, optimal control theory uh, was applied by Keynesian theorists until then. Um, so yes, so they, they rely on rational expectations to, to show that, because uh, without rational expectation, agents will not uh, adjust their behavior to the new policy. Um, but um, because they will expect the future policy to, to be just like before, they, they will be irrational, and so uh, they, they, will, they will believe somehow uh, the decision maker, even if the decision maker is not credible. And, uh, and so under rational expectation, the optimal policy is uh, to not uh, change the, the, the policy at every period, but is to stick to a rule, even if at a given period you would have, um, you thought that uh, you would have, uh, an, uh, you would be better off by deviating from this policy. Actually, in the long run, it's better to stick to this rule. Uh, yes, because if agents anticipate that the policy will be readjusted, then they don't act according to the plan. Okay, and the, the, the big uh, change that they produced in, the, in macro is the real business cycle model that really propelled the DSG supremacy on, on macro. In this model, they borrow both from uh, growth models like the the one we've seen from Cass Koopmans, but uh, an extended version of it that accounts for um, uh, stochasticity. And from Lucas, so uh, they, they use rational expectation. Uh, the the main, main way people adapt is through intertemporal substitution of labor, and they abide by Lucas methodology. The difference with Lucas is uh, that fluctuations result from real shocks, not monetary shocks. And by real shocks, I mean uh, technology shocks. So shocks in the productivity. So you can think of this of an invention, for example. An invention is a positive uh, technology shock that you didn't, uh, you could not anticipate and has real effect. Uh, you, it will uh, basically uh, increase your output. Um, and um, this is the cause of fluctuation, and uh, the economy they describe uh, as no imperfection, no market imperfection, so uh, prices adjust instantly, uh, there is a perfect competition, 
and uh, there is a representative agent that optimizes their interoperable decision, which are savings versus uh, consumption and labor versus leisure. They, they calibrate the model. So calibration is a much more rend rudimentary way of uh, finding the parameters of a model that, than what was used uh, already at the time, which is estimation. So calibration, uh, you, for example, to, to, to calibrate the, the production function, you, you say uh, you can just take the, the, the parameter height of your hat and, and say, okay, one third uh, of uh, the coefficient alpha in the cup of glass is one third. Uh, because uh, that's what all, all economists before me have used, basically. Um, in estimation, um, you, you, you estimate uh, all the parameters of your model jointly using observations. Uh, so you use statistical techniques to estimate the parameters, so they don't come from your hat. Uh, because with, with calibration, of course, you, you adjust the parameters in the, parameter, in the calibration process, until uh, you have, uh, your, your model fits well the data, but uh, it's not uh, really um, statistically grounded. Their model was a huge success, um, par at least partly because uh, it had a good data fit. Um, although, so yes, so their model is structural, but we can also do, um, assumption-free models in the economy that are called vector autoregression models, where you just uh, look at the time series, uh, like the, the, the data in the past from uh, uh, several variables you're interested in, and um, you, you just uh, allow any uh, relationship between them, linear relationship uh, between each variable and the other, uh, and each variable and the lags uh, of the others, and you, you estimate this uh, automatically uh, by a program. This is uh, usually better than a structural model where you impose restrictions. You impose that uh, most of the variables do not influence most of others. Uh, and you, you take only uh, a few relationships that uh, are explained in terms of, uh, of economic um, behavior. You, you can, you can give uh, a justification why we have this relationship in the variables, and we can understand the model. Um, so if uh, we tested their model against an assumption-free model, uh, it would uh, fail uh, in the sense that it, it's, not, it, it's worse at predicting the future. Uh, but uh, it has still a good data fit, considering that uh, it, it makes some assumptions uh, it has a structure and that uh, it's, it's hard to, to compete with a, an assumption-free model. By the way, some economists uh, argue that uh, because the, the assumption-free models are better at predicting the future, we should use them instead of structural models like uh, the RBC or any other DSGE models. Uh, but, but DSGE people would uh, reply, yes, but uh, with your VAR model, you don't understand uh, what's going on. And uh, it's subject to the Lucas critique that uh, your, the parameters you estimate, they will change with a change in policy. Um, also, the conclusion of their paper, it's not the important thing in their paper. It's not why we, we thought this paper is important. The reason why we think it's important is uh, for the, the, the model they introduced and the methodology. Uh, but um, but the, the, the conclusion of their paper um, is that 70% um, of the fluctuation, the business cycle's fluctuations, were correctly replicated by their model. Or 70% of the variance was uh, explained by their model. Uh, and in their model, the only uh, driver of business fluctuations are technology shocks. So uh, they said most of business uh, fluctuations are due to uh, technology shocks. The thing is, this result is not credible um, because first, the way they measure uh, technology shocks was already known at the time uh, to be completely flawed. 
uh, it's uh, the, the, the thing they take as technology shocks is the solar residual is the I've talked uh, about it uh, in the last session so um, it's uh, it, it doesn't only account for um, for changes in productivity but uh, it also captures uh, changes in the, the utilization of capital uh, it wouldn't even measure uh, productivity uh, changes under increasing return to scale, etc. So it was already known at the time that there were measurement issues with this. They still used it. And uh, it's not credible also for a basic reason that uh, how could you explain like, uh, for example, the 82 uh, recession uh, by technology shock? Would it mean that suddenly in 82 uh, we lost uh, a technology? We, we forgot about, uh, about how to produce uh, something? And, uh, and this is why there was a drop in output. Uh, maybe for invention, we, could, uh, we can understand that maybe with the internet, uh, an invention of internet productivity raised, but uh, we, we don't see how the story would fit for recessions. So um, con concerning the policy conclusions, um, it's laissez-faire, of course, because uh, the fluctuations are optimal. At each period, uh, agents optimize, and the reason why there is uh, unemployment or underemployment in certain periods is just because it's, it's an optimal reaction to the shocks. Uh, people decrease their labor supply because wages are low, and uh, there is no reason to, to, for the state to intervene because, um, because the, the economy is already at the optimal. But of course, the model is uh, not realistic. Uh, because many features of the economy uh, lack, like market imperfection, money, etc. Uh, Prescott is also famous for um, a contribution he made with the uh, Hodrick, uh, the Hodrick Prescott filter, HP filter, uh, which is uh, used to extract from a uh, time series uh, the, the trend because. They're interested in business fluctuations. So when they look at uh, the evolution of the economy, they use the detrended variables. They remove from every variables the predictable trend. Like uh, if there is a growth rate of 2% on average in the last 40 years, they, they would uh, just uh, remove this growth trend of 2%. And how can they find the trend? Using the um, Hardwick Prescott filter. Um, do you want to explain how it works? Uh, do you like uh, mathematic uh, understanding? Yes? So uh, basically, you have um, a variable y. That's a time series, it evolves over time. And you want to split it into two components, a trend and uh, a component that varies around the trend. Um, you will minimize the sum of two terms. One term is the um, deviation from the trend, and the other, so delta t is the, the discrete derivative of t, so delta t, t plus 1 minus delta t at t, is the, the change in slope uh, in, the, the time, uh, in the time series uh, at each period, at a given period. And so here you, will, you want to minimize the, the change in slope. Uh, you, you minimize, remember, um, uh, according to uh, theta, uh, t, uh, which is actually a tau, but uh, yeah, tau. Um, so, so what you extract from it is a trend. So a trend, you don't want that the trend follows each of the movement of the time series. So you want something smooth. So you don't want that it changes uh, of uh, slope uh, too much. And there is a compromise between not wanting that it changes of slope too much, that is, you want a trend, and uh, wanting that it, uh, it follows the, the, the curve uh, quite well. Um, and, uh, and lambda uh, is the way you, you make this compromise. It's a weight you give to uh, the, the minimization of uh, the, is the weight you give to the um, smoothness 
uh, and uh, and the other term is the the weight uh, you give uh, to uh, to the variability. Or well, maybe it's contrary to that I just said. Um, and so lambda, they, they give a value. Uh, it depends on the. I think when when uh, the, the data is uh, taken at each uh, quarter, at each, uh, uh, yeah, uh, which is the case in macro data, uh, it's like delta equals 1,600 uh, that they find the, the good value somehow. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's quite uh, technical. Uh, it has been criticized. Some prefer to use just uh, moving averages. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but it's a commonly used um, way to extract the trend. Uh, so now I've uh, finished uh, about macro so far. I will still talk about macro um, in the le next uh, lecture, which maybe it will be today. But uh, for the, the, the rest of today, of, uh, I mean, of this lecture, I will talk of the, the, the Chicago School economists that were not macroeconomists. Okay, so the, the economist we cover in this lecture um, from the Chicago School um, take the, the hypothesis of rationality to the extreme and, uh, and I'll present uh, some others, uh, Nobel Prize, that uh, participated in this uh, movement. Um, first one is James Buchanan who is uh, one of the most important figure of the uh, theory of public choice. Public choice is a theory that applies economic reasoning to political science. As Buchanan puts it, it's politics without romance. And the main assumption in public choice is that decisions emerge from self-interested rational individual in uh, some kind of market, a political market. So the voters are self-interested and rational, uh, but so are the politicians, so are the um, lobbies, etc. So if uh, politicians act uh, uh, according to social welfare, it's just by coincidence, because fundamentally they pursue their own interests. So this theory, you see uh, how it is uh, libertarian, like the other from the Chicago School, because it emphasizes government failures. Um, there are inefficiency caused by a government intervention when the government, uh, when people in the government pursue their own interests, their special interests, instead of pursuing the general interest of the public. Good example is regulatory capture, which was uh, coined by, by uh, Stigler. Who, uh, I'll talk uh, in a minute about Stigler. So a regulatory capture is when uh, special interests um, gain in the political fight, um, because, for example, so yes, say you, the, the government wants to regulate a, a sector of the economy. Let's say the um, yeah the, the lorry drivers or the the government wants to impose a carbon tax. Um, so this will uh, help everyone in the economy because this will lower cl climate change, but everyone will gain just a little from this policy. But there are some special interests that have lots to gain to be exempted from this regulation. For example, the lorry drivers, the truck drivers. So they will defend their interests, they will lobby, and um, there is a high chances that uh, they will obtain this exemption because they are a minority with a strong interest to defend, so uh, they, they will uh, put lot of effort to do it, and the majority of people, even though uh, summing all of their individual loss, uh, they, they collectively loss uh, with this ex exemption, each individual uh, loss, loses too few, too little, to uh, fight this uh, lorry driver lobby. And um, it is rational for the lorry drivers to uh, lobby. It is rational for the silent majority to remain silent because it would be too costly to organize and, uh, and to overcome the, the free rider problem, the, the, the problem that uh, if uh, some among the silent majority 
uh, lobby against the lorry drivers, it will benefit all the silent majority. Uh, but um, so the cost of uh, lobbying would be incurred just by some people, and for these people, the cost will outweigh the benefit. And the politicians uh, also have good reasons to accept uh, the exemptions for the special interest, uh, for example, through corruption, because uh, they, they promise money to the politician illegally, or campaign contributions, or uh, because the politician just doesn't want uh, to be annoyed by uh, harassed by, by uh, lorry drivers or that. Yeah. For, for tons of reasons, they, they, they can also uh, have good reasons to, to accept this. And in this case, we say that the regulation is captured by uh, the special interest it is supposed to be regulating. The landmark book of, uh, of James Buchanan was co-written by uh, Tullock and is called The Calculus of Consent. And it pioneered constitutional economics where they were looking for uh, rational ways to devise a constitution. And uh, their idea is that the policies that are enacted are shaped by the constitution, so the policy rules. And their aim was at designing consensual policy rules. That's their criterion for a good constitution. It should be consented by uh, anyone. It should has, has have a unanimous consent. So everyone in society should benefit from this constitution. And actually, even in policies, they think that each policy should be Pareto improving. So it's a very demanding a uh, criterion for constitution or for policy that everyone will gain from it. And uh, it has, again, a libertarian uh, flavor uh, that uh, something should not uh, be done to someone if uh, this person doesn't want it. Uh, so everything uh, sh should be like a contract uh, signed by a consenting people. And, uh, and, and so there is low legitimacy, according to Buchanan, to impose things uh, to, to, to people uh, that they do not want uh, through uh, the, the state legislation. There is still a way uh, for Buchanan to uh, pass uh, policies that would, uh, in principle, uh, make uh, some losers. They would, some people would lose uh, a little. And, and some winners, if those who win, uh, would win a lot. The way to do that is that the winners could compensate the losers by just paying them money. So that uh, the losers uh, do not lose anymore, the winners don't, wait, don't gain as much as they, they would have liked, but they still gain from the policy. And so he shows that optimality can be reached through side payments and advocates for transforming votes into marketable property rights. He finds it uh, legit that uh, people can buy the votes of others um, because it's a way to reach Pareto uh, efficiency. If, uh, if, you, if you, you are ready to, to vote for the policy um, because you have been bought, it means that uh, you don't lose for, from the policy. You have been compensated. And uh, this theory was able to explain uh, some things that previous uh, models in political science didn't. Um, in particular, log rolling, the fact that uh, votes are bargained between uh, parliamentaries of different parties, for example, because they are not uh, allowed to, to just buy the votes of others, but uh, they can uh, form uh, coalition program where uh, party A uh, accept to, to pass a uh, law that party B wants and vice versa. Okay, now there is uh, Gary Becker, uh, which was called uh, economic imperialist by uh, George Stigler. And when I say is a romantic one, uh, it's uh, ironical. Uh, because he applies the assumption of uh, cold, self-interested rationality to any aspect of uh, human behavior. 
it started with uh, the economics of discrimination. So he, he defines discrimination as a loss incurred by a discriminated group due to a dislike of discriminators. And uh, according to him, discrimination is unstable and uh, in a competitive market, it will disappear naturally because it is not profitable. Uh, I'm not sure it applies to all kinds of discrimination, but um, he thought of it like in, in, uh, the, um, in the job market or in the, um, the housing market. So say you are a, a, a racist employer and uh, you don't like uh, black people, so you will hire only uh, non-black people. Uh, then, uh, it, let's say many, many uh, employers are racist like that. Then it means that the few employers that are not racist, uh, they will uh, be able to, to hire black people at a lower wage because uh, black people desperately, desperately want a job. Um, and so because they, they will pay less their employees for the same job, uh, they are more competitive and uh, they can force their racist uh, competitors out of business because they, they will be much more profitable. So that's the theory and um, the problem with the theory is that it encourages uh, not to do anything against uh, discrimination. Um, Then uh, he applies this uh, rationality assumption to the economics of crimes, and uh, the, bottom the bottom line is that crime pays. Otherwise, why would there be so much recidive? Uh, if, uh, like, okay, some people can make a mistake once, but why would they do the same mistake again as soon as they go out of prison? For Gary Becker, it's because uh, it was the rational things to do to. Um, to do the crime and uh, incur the risk to go to prison. And for him, the good way to model uh, criminal behavior is that criminals uh, make a cost-benefit analysis. They, they balance the, the benefit of, uh, I don't know, stealing uh, some computer with the, the cost or the risk of going to prison. And uh, if they do the crime, it's because uh, it was worth also explain why uh, low educated people commit more crimes because their opportunity costs are lower because if they don't go to prison they will only find a lowest job or maybe no no way no job at all so they have uh, nothing much to lose basically by not uh, committing a crime uh, it also explains why some uh, subgroup of the population like teenagers take more drug and commit more crimes uh, this is because they have different preferences. They value the future less than uh, older people. And, and then when they compute the, the, the cost and benefits, because the, the costs are in the future, uh, the risk of going to prison, they discount it heavily and uh, they, they see more the benefit of it. Uh, of course, this theory uh, neglects lots of factors that have been shown uh, crucial uh, determinants of crime like uh, the way you were raised, uh, raised as a child, were there, uh, were there child abuse, child neglect? Uh, did you grow up in an environment where it gangs, uh, with a family uh, with drug addiction problems, uh, etc.? Uh, for, for, for this theory, this doesn't matter because this doesn't have a, an impact on the cost or the benefits. He also applied this type of reasoning to the family, where he views the family as a production unit, uh, where marriage uh, allows specialization uh, within the couple, and uh, a division of labor that uh, produces gains uh, in efficiency that can be shared uh, so that uh, each uh, partner uh, is better off as, uh, when they, were, they, they, they will be alone because uh, one partner will specialize in uh, paid work uh, and so be more productive than that. And one uh, partner will specialize in uh, domestic work, like raising the children or cooking, and will be better and more efficient at that. Um, he also views uh, love and sexual activity or frequent close contact with a particular person as a particular non-marketable household com commodity. 
that's uh, very romantic of, of him. Um, yeah, and the book uh, explains it all, is the economic approach to human behavior. So here, the idea is that the, the reason why um, you, 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 you love someone uh, or you have sex with someone is because uh, this uh, act provides you a service at a reasonable cost. <laughs> and it's a non-marketable cost, meaning that uh, usually you cannot buy it uh, on the market or it would be immoral. But, uh, but it still enters the utility function and it's a cost in terms of what you have to do for the others, or etc. Uh, so according to this uh, book, intelligent and beautiful people are more likely to marry because uh, they have higher non-market productivity. So I let you imagine what it means having a higher productivity in terms of uh, sexual activity when you're beautiful or in terms of raising children when you're intelligent or whatever. So these are desired characteristics for your partner. So that's why uh, you are more likely to marry. And uh, he even uh, pursued the reasoning as uh, seeing child as uh, durable goods and that directly enters the utility function. And, uh, and actually, so all the economists were shocked uh, when uh, Guy Baker came out with his theory in the, in the 70s and didn't take him seriously. But uh, in the end, uh, he got the Nobel Prize. And, uh, and, and as some weird theory like, uh, like, uh, about uh, the reason why people have, children, like the, the, have lots of children or few children uh, has become accepted in the economic profession. Uh, it's also a way for economists to apply their techniques to a broad range of uh, social uh, human behavior. And so, uh, in this view, the reason why people have fewer children now than in the past, it's because the, the cost of uh, education uh, has raised and the expectation we have in terms of education for our child uh, has raised. And so people prefer to have less child, but as a... Uh, Baker puts it of higher quality, uh, that you would have invested more in wild child uh, in terms of uh, time and, uh, and uh, money uh, for their education and so on, uh, than in the past where uh, um, the quantity uh, mattered most, more. What did he get the Nobel Prize for exactly? Like was it the peace? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, he got the Nobel Prize for, for this, all of this together. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, and uh, he applied the same methods uh, to education, altruism, and even suicide. And so here I have uh, to, to put a warning side that if uh, in your cost-benefit analysis you find that uh, the benefit of killing yourself outweigh the cost, please double check your computation before you do it. <laughs> um, Yes. And, uh, and now George Stigler, so also from uh, Chicago. Uh, with, with, uh, with Friedman, it was uh, uh, one of the, the main uh, representatives of, of the Chicago School. He applied uh, this uh, idea of, of rationality to the, um, the search for information. And uh, he answers questions like, why don't people always buy their cell phones from the cheapest website? And actually, why do prices differ among websites in the first place? So do, do someone has a, an answer to that? I mean, there's, there's some costs that might differ also, like some, one website buys huge quantities of certain phones, and then another website makes uh, <laughs> Okay, so, okay, so that, that uh, could be a reason why uh, the cost differs among websites, but then why uh, wouldn't everyone buy the phone from the cheapest website? Maybe there are other factors like trust in the website or something like that. Okay, that's related, but that's not his answer. Yes? Exactly, they don't know what the cheapest price is and it is costly to them to search which, uh, 
which is the cheapest one. So there is a cost of acquiring information. It's time consuming and time is money. And this Impel idea launched a new field, the economics of information. So according to this theory, uh, like, uh, yeah, people maximize their utility and so they acquire more information only as long as the marginal benefit of new information exceeds the marginal cost. And so uh, if there is, there is probably decreasing return, maybe uh, you can check two websites because, uh, because uh, why not? But, uh, but checking three websites, four websites, at, at each additional website you check, you have uh, less chance to find um, a cheaper uh, cell phone. And so uh, it's not worth it. Um, and so, um, even though uh, you can think that this introduces some um, friction in, uh, in economic models because people do not have uh, perfect information because they don't, uh, it's not in their interest to know all the information, uh, this view still defends rationality and competitive markets in the sense that he assumes perfect information about information. This means that he assumes that people know the cost of acquiring information. And that's how they can optimize their information acquisition. But it's a dubious assumption because it's inher inherent to information to not know uh, what is the value of this information until you know the information itself. Um, so, but, but yeah, but in some specific case, it can be um, can make sense. This uh, theory changed with the upcoming of the internet. I mean, in '61, I think mean, cost yeah. of information was pretty, I think, easy to understand. But I mean, nowadays, costs. I would say, if I if I Google for a certain jacket, within like seconds, I find I don't know, let's say nine percent of of all possible jobs that offer it to me. Yes, so we, it's a good point. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I, I updated uh, the um, eighth theory with a current example where I'm talking about websites. But uh, in, the, in the 80s, it was much more costly to call, uh, to, to look in the, in the yeah, to call every uh, store uh, one after the other to know the price of their, of their uh, I don't know what, computer, huge computers. Uh, so, so yes, uh, with internet, is information still applies uh, maybe not to cell phones, but uh, to, to more complex things. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, he, he was also a precursor of industrial economics. He studied uh, in detail how uh, specific markets work and uh, how they determine the pr their prices. And um, he also contributed to public choice. As I said, he was the one uh, who coined uh, regulatory capture. Uh, that is when regulations benefit the companies that they are supposed to control. And that led him to advocate deregulation. Uh, he was the editor of uh, the Journal of Political Economy, which is one of the top five journal in economics. Uh, in, the, in the economic profession, it's very important to, 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 have, to, be, uh, to publish in this uh, top five journal, uh, much more important than the sixth or seventh one. And uh, this journal is edited uh, in Chicago, and he was the main editor for almost 20 years, which, uh, which shows that he was a very influential per person in the profession. Okay, uh, are there any questions? Okay, so I have um, five minutes. Um, so I don't have time to cover a lot about the, the next lecture. But I will still start. So, okay, as you may know, uh, next Monday we will know the next uh, uh, economic Nobel Prize. And uh, I hope uh, it will be a new Canadian economist because uh, this is, uh, I'll talk about new Canadian economists in the next lectures, but so far there hadn't been any Nobel Prize among them. Uh, I, I still feel the need to talk about them because this is the way uh, macro is done uh, nowadays. Uh, macro hasn't stopped with the RBC model, um, but, but it's too recent. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it came in the, in the early 2000s 
and so they didn't have a Nobel Prize yet. Um, so, so yes, if I if I have to risk uh, myself to make a, a pronostic, I, I it would be uh, Galli, Gartler, and, and Woodford uh, if it's a new Canadian economist. But uh, but but the the one I would the ones I would really like that they have the Nobel Prize would be uh, Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, who revolutionized uh, the way we, we think about inequality and taxation. Uh, but maybe it's too soon for them to get it because they are too young. Uh, yeah. Because usually people get the Nobel Prize at the end of their career, uh, when we are sure they will not uh, do some stupid stuff uh, afterwards. Um, OK. So. Um, so for, for, for Keynes, I mean, the, the goal of, of Keynes' general theory was to prove that um, there is involuntary unemployment, at least sometimes, and not for classical reasons, meaning not because uh, wages are rigid downwards. The classical explanation for involuntary explanation is that uh, for some reason, unions, minimum wage legislation, uh, or something that can be changed, uh, wages are set too high, um, and uh, and if they were allowed uh, to decrease, then um, firms would uh, would hire more. Um, so the goal of Keynes was to show that there was uh, involuntary unemployment, uh, but but f despite flexible wages. Then um, neo Keynesians economists. In the in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, didn't manage to to reconciliate involuntary unemployment with flexible wages, so they resorted to uh, rigidity in wages uh, or sticky uh, wages or imperfect competitions, so oligopolies, monopolies, to explain why the economy doesn't reach the optimum equilibria and why government intervention is needed. So um, this, this was okay for this economist uh, to, to betray a little uh, Keynes' goal because the, con the policy conclusion was the same. Uh, it supported government intervention. And um, yes, so so sticky. So um, so yeah. So so for classical economics, uh, prices are flexible, but for Keynesians, uh, they are sticky. They they evolve uh, not instantly, but uh, but slowly. Then um, some uh, theorists like Patinkin uh, use this sluggishness to show that the Weyerian equilibrium, so the competitive equilibrium will be reached, but too slowly. And this is a justification for government intervention in the short run, because uh, otherwise the, the full employment will be attained too slowly. Then uh, you have um, thinkers like Clower or Lei Jean Umfoud, who criticized um, the Valerian framework altogether. So the variation framework, I will, I will talk about it in the next lecture, actually. Uh, but it's the general equilibrium uh, framework, uh, where uh, every agent, uh, so firms and consumers uh, slash uh, workers, uh, optimize. And uh, the, 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 because of decreasing return and because uh, of a perfect competition uh, and perfect information, uh, the, the prices of the economy are set to their correct true value, um, the equilibrium value uh, that clear the market and uh, make that there is no uh, involuntary unemployment and um, that the, the, the economy is efficient. These guys um, criticized neo Keynesians for their lack of uh, Keynesianism. They, 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 they explained that actually the, the book of Leo Jean Unfoud uh, is entitled um, The Economics of Keynes 
and Keynesian economics, uh, highlighting the difference between the two, that the, the way neo-Keynesians, or Keynesians, as it says, economists uh, work, uh, is not uh, really um, uh, compatible with uh, the, what Keynes had in mind. And uh, they said that is because they use the variation framework, which is antagonistic with Keynes' idea, because what Keynes uh, saw is that there is a coordination problem in uh, society, which makes the, the, the prices wrong. This is because information doesn't uh, flow perfectly uh, between people. This, we can also make the link with Stigler. Um, and um, the thing is that in the variation framework, the way the, the, the prices uh, are uh, attained is uh, through um, an imaginary process called the Tatanmore process, which uh, happens instantly and uh, adjusts the price instantly in a non-realistic way. And, uh, and so they, they, they thought that following Keynes, that uh, maybe quantities are just faster than prices, uh, which completely changes the, the way the economy behaves. It doesn't, it's not efficient anymore if, uh, if quantities are just instead of prices. And uh, their idea uh, gave rise to non-valuation models, um, which are often called disequilibrium uh, macroeconomic models. But it's a misnomer because these models are really about uh, finding an equilibrium, just not a valorization, not a competitive equilibrium. So in these models, you have an equilibrium, but with wrong prices. For example, the rate of interest will be too high, so that investment will be too low, so that uh, aggregate demand will be too low, and you will have involuntary unemployment. Or because of uh, monopolies, uh, prices uh, of some goods will be too high, uh, so that people uh, will, will, uh, will buy less uh, of these goods than uh, if the, the, the price was true. And uh, because, people, because people buy less, there is less demand, so there is uh, less activity, less employment, as uh, in the, the competitive equilibrium. Um, and the reason why prices are false it's because of a deep inherent malfunctioning of the price formation mechanism and not because of a policy like the minimum wage or uh, something that can be changed like unions. It's something um, that is uh, really uh, due to the behavior of people uh, that, that cannot be changed or to the, to the way the society uh, functions. Uh, so we have rigid prices. Um, yeah, this, this, this malfunctioning of the price formation can be due either to rigid prices for inherent re reasons or from uh, imperfect competitions like monopolies. So these models, um, so yeah, the, the Barrow and Grossman uh, started it, then Benassi and a bunch of other French people um, were working on that in the 70s. The, the model of Benassi is, uh, is quite um, compelling. It's, uh, it's much more realistic than the, the DSG models, than the neo conditions models. Uh, and it can explain, so it, it, it almost reached the, the Keynesian goal to have uh, an equilibrium theory with um, uh, involuntary unemployment uh, and flexible wage. So we don't have flexible wage. Uh, I mean, yes, we have flexible wage when, when, uh, the, rigid when uh, the rigidities are due to in perfect competitions. Um, so, so yes, but uh, these models didn't have uh, posterity, uh, partly because they were static, and, uh, and, and so we wanted the dynamic model to study the evolution of things, and, uh, and partly because once they did that, they didn't know what to do afterwards, while for the RBC model, it was so uh, full of, of problems that, uh, that many economists came to the, the RBC framework and improved on it. So, uh, so this created a strong community um, and uh, this community didn't, didn't have the same uh, success. Uh, okay, so um, what new Keynesians uh, do? So new Keynesians, uh, so 
appeared as a counter reaction to the DSG paradigm, to the RBC uh, supremacy. So they, they came out in the 80s, 90s, uh, and even more the, this century. And uh, they, 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 they accepted the, the DSG um, paradigm, they accepted uh, the Lucas critique and the uh, Lucas methodology, but they changed, it, they changed the assumptions and the models uh, to make it, uh, to give it a Keynesian flavor. And uh, the, the two big changes are sticky prices and uh, monopolistic competition. So I'll stop here and uh, I'll explain that in the next uh, lecture. Thank you.